Praise the Lord and God bless you today. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We're blessed of the Lord. We're still here in the land of the living and I'm so grateful for another opportunity to join with the people of God in fellowship and in God's word. I want to give the people of God an opportunity to come in to the room. Uh, certainly, we trust and believe that you have been enjoying the word of the Lord through this ministry, joining together with Greater Refuge Temple here in Washington, D.C. and Jeremiah Temple there in Baltimore, Maryland, and Refuge Temple Annex in the Bronx, New York, those of you who join us weekly, we're grateful to the Lord for your love and your support. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you and we're so grateful for all that you are and for all that you do. We ask your continued blessings in our life. Help us, Lord. Open up your word. Speak to our very hearts and minds tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm in the book of Daniel on this evening, Daniel chapter 5, and I want to talk about the handwriting is on the wall. The handwriting is on the wall. I'm going to use this chapter. I want to read chapter 5, if you bear with me. Um... It reads like this, Belshazzar, the king, made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, whilst he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines might drink therein, then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple out of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem. And the king and his princes, his wives, his concubines drank in them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver, of brass and iron, of wood and of stone. In that same hour came four fingers of a man's hand wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed and his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his loins were loosed and his knees smote one against another. He's getting ready to pass out. The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. And the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, Whosoever shall read this writing, show me the interpretation thereof, shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about his neck. It shall be the third rule in the kingdom. Then came in all the king's wise men, but they could not read the writing nor make known to the king the interpretation thereof. Then was King Belshazzar greatly troubled, and his countenance was changed in him, and his lords were astonished. Now the queen, by reason of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banquet house, and the queen spake and said, O king, live forever. Let not thy thoughts trouble thee, nor let thy countenance be changed. There is a man in thy kingdom, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, was found in him, whom the king, Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, the king, I say, thy father, made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. For as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding, interpreting of dreams and showing of hard sentences and dissolving doubts were found in the same Daniel whom the king named Belshazzar. Now let Daniel be called and he will show the interpretation. Then was Daniel brought in before the king, and the king spake and said unto Daniel, Art thou that Daniel which art of the children of captivity of Judah, 
whom the king my father brought out of Jewry. I have even heard of thee, that the spirit of the gods is in thee, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in thee. And now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me that they should read this writing and make known unto me the interpretation thereof, but they could not show the interpretation of the thing. And I have heard of thee that thou canst make interpretations and dissolve doubts. Now if thou canst read the writing and make known to me the interpretation thereof, thou shalt be clothed with scarlet, have a chain of gold about thy neck, and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let thy gifts be to thyself and give thy rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing unto the king and make known to him the interpretation. O thou king, the most high God, gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, languages, trembled and feared before him whom he w he would he slew rather and whom he would he kept alive and whom he would he set up and whom he would he put down but when his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride he was deposed of his kingly throne and they took his glory from him and he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beast, and his dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God ruled the kingdom of men, that he appointed over whomsoever he will. And thou, his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this but has lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before thee, and thou and thy lords, thy wives, and thy concubines have drunk wine in them. And thou hast praised the gods of silver, gold, brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know, and the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified. Then was the part of the hand sent from him, and this writing was written. And this is the writing that was written. Many, many tekel of Hurison. This is the interpretation of the thing. Many, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tickle, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Paris, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold about his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. In that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. Darius the median took the kingdom being about three score and two years old. That's the lesson. That's the chapter in its entirety. We're in the book of Daniel, which deals with God's sovereignty in history. God rules. He knows who's going to be on top. He knows who's going to be leading. He arranges and orchestrates everything. His sovereignty in history. No matter who sat in the chair, God was still in control always. This one chapter also deals with judgment on human pride. Remember that scripture? Pride comes before destruction, a haughty spirit before the fall. So the purpose of this book was written to assure the Old Testament covenant people that their judgment they're in captivity. Babylonian captivity, you know. They had to sit there in Babylon because they failed to obey God. So Daniel is really written to reassure the Old Testament covenant people that their judgment 
of captivity under Gentile nations was not their permanent destiny. Just because you're there doesn't mean that this is your permanent place. No, God made them a promise. They are there because of their disrespect, their disobedience, their unfaithfulness to a wise and mighty God. The second reason it's written is to bequeath to God's people throughout history. That includes you and I the prophetic visions of God's sovereignty over the nations. And also it deals with the final triumph of his kingdom on the earth. So the text, 25 years have passed since the events of chapter 4 and over 70 years since the events that you read in chapter 1 of Daniel. Daniel himself now is advanced in years. He's an old man. He is considered a senior statesman in Babylon. He's outlasted a number of kings. And in his time, Belshazzar, the last of the Chaldean kings of Babylon, is going to be killed. And Babylon is going to fall. It's going to pass from Chaldean rule to the rule of the Medes and then to the Persians. Darius, remember that name? So in chapters one through four, we have an account of the life of Nebuchadnezzar. He was the one that came in and ransacked the city of Jerusalem. Jeremiah, I believe, was the one who prophesied and said, 70 years of bondage will you have unless you turn back to God because they would not do this. Now Nebuchadnezzar would come in and bring the children of Israel into Babylonia, right? By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, our hearts wept when we remembered Zion. And they came to us and said, sing us one of those songs of Zion. And they answered back. And the Levite has recorded, they took their harps and hung them in the willow trees. They were sitting there. And they spoke back and said, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land. So Nebuchadnezzar would be the first Babylonian king to rule over the Jews. So the account looks at several events in the life of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, which would eventually bring him to his knees in worship and praise. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar had to be brought down too, but eventually because of what he had to go through, God turned him into a beast. He had to go and eat the grass like the cows, the dew. He was wet and smelly. Yes, this great king God had to bring down to his knees, brought him to a place where finally he would worship the Lord God of Israel. Daniel then passes over several kings, giving us a brief account of the last day in the reign of Belshazzar, who was Nebuchadnezzar's son. But Belshazzar would be the last of the Chaldean kings to rule over God's people. So, and we read it at the end of the book, the death of Belshazzar at the hand of Darius is, was only a partial fulfillment of the prophecy that was revealed to Nebuchadnezzar. Remember the dream in chapter 2, and I'm trying to move quickly so we could jump into the lesson. Um, chapter 2, it talks about the dream that Nebuchadnezzar has, and Daniel would inform Nebuchadnezzar that his kingdom was the first of four kingdoms to precede the coming of the Messiah. So it was messianic, his his vision, or I should say the interpretation, was messianic. He, he sees the Messiah coming. Four kingdoms to precede the Messiah's coming. His was the kingdom of gold. Remember, the head of gold. Head fell and rolled. To be followed by a lesser kingdom of silver. Daniel 2 and 39 Daniel 2 and 39, and after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over the earth. So the kingdom of silver 
is introduced in Daniel chapter 5, which, which is where we are. So when Darius captured Babylon and Belshazzar is put to death, the Medo-Persian kingdom. This is when that Medo-Persian kingdom is born, which is fulfilling only the first part of the prophecy, which was revealed through Daniel. So we've read Daniel chapter 5, verses 1 through 31. One of the most graphic pictures of life that could possibly be drawn is brought before us in this fifth chapter of Daniel. It is describing the passing, of course, of a great empire mm -hmm, and the downfall of the head of gold. That's Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel 2 and 32 this image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass. Let's skip down to verse 37. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven have given thee a kingdom, power and strength and glory. This is Daniel speaking to Nebuchadnezzar and saying, you're there because God put you there. Remember the scripture that says he puts up one and he'll take down another. Let's go down to verse 38 of Daniel 2. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beast of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand and hath made thee. He's letting him know God made you the ruler. God did this. Doesn't matter how good or bad God is in control. He has made the ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. So the scene is the city of Babylon. Remember, Babylon was founded by Nimrod. I'll go there. Genesis 10, verses 9 and 10. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore, it was said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter, before the Lord and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Eric and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. So Babylon founded by Nimrod, which was the most, it was considered the most significant and luxurious, luxurious city of that day in the ancient world. It was surrounded by what was considered an Pregnable fortress, 15 miles square, and it was considered to be unpregnable. No one could destroy or conquer it because there was a wall, right? 87 feet thick. 87 feet thick, 350 feet high. And on the walls, uh, which were surrounded by a, a 35 foot moat filled with water. And there were 250 watchtowers. <laughs> this is a bad city. And they knew it too. Can't nobody come up in here. And many of uh, the people that lived there, and back then, the, the statistics that were written, history says that over one million people lived in this beautifully designed city, right? Their houses had ornaments on it. Hallelujah, chimes on the houses. They were very proud and they just knew that no one can just come up in here. But if we read in Isaiah uh, and even in the book of Jeremiah, we read the prediction of not only the rise of the city, but the overthrow of this fabulous place. I'll read out of Isaiah 44, 27, that saith to thee, deep be dry, and I will dry up thy rivers. Mm -hmm. That saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasures, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shalt be laid. Starting there all the way through chapter 45 and verse 2, the prophet is talking about the rise and the demise of this city. Jeremiah does it as well in the 51st chapter, verses 28 through 32. Jeremiah 51, 
28 through 32, it says, prepare against her the nations with the kings of the Medes, captains thereof, and all the rulers thereof, and all the land of his dominion. And the land shall tremble and sorrow, for every purpose of the Lord shall be performed against Babylon, to make the land of Babylon a desolation without an inhabitant. The mighty men of Babylon have forborne to fight, to have remained in their holes. They might have failed. They became as women. They have burned her dwelling places. Her bars are broken. One post shall run to meet another, and one messenger to meet another to show the kingdom of Babylon that the city is taken at one end, and that the passages are stopped, and the reeds they have burned with fire, and the men of war are affrighted. So we read the prediction of the rise and the overflow of this fabulous city. So here in Daniel, the fifth chapter, we read, of its downfall and its complete demise, the end of Babylonian rule. So while the king was holding a fast, mm -hmm, Darius and his invading a feast, I'm sorry, while the king, Belshazzar, was having a feast and he gets besides himself and he puts, he pulls the, the holy vessels, hallelujah, that have been taken when, uh, Israel was overtaken and brought into Babylon. He takes those holy artifacts and fills them with wine and gets drunk. He, his wives, and his concubines. So while the king is holding a feast, Darius and his invading armies who had diverted the course of the river Euphrates, they went up against the flow of the river. Hallelujah. Swarmed up the muddy bank of the river. Took their time crawled up beneath the walls and the sewage passages of the walls, underneath the walls, came up into the city. Mm -hmm. And there are four prominent people in this chapter before us, and we have to talk about them in this one chapter, and we read it through. So let's dive in. Let's, let's talk about first what we have learned uh, or told about the king. And we learn this from the first four verses of the fifth chapter, Daniel 5, 1 through 4, right? Belshazzar, the king, made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple. Remember, when he overtook the city, he goes into the temple he destroys the temple, tears up the seating, rips the gold and silver off of the wall, pulls out all of the holy vessels, and burns everything down. So he takes the silver vessels that his father had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives, his concubines might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, and the king and his princes, his wives, his concubines drank in them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. Mm -hmm. So we find that the king was Belshazzar. Now I said he was Nebuchadnezzar's son. Let me make that correction. He is the grandson. I should say the great-grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. He makes a feast and he invites all of his magistrates, all of his lords and their wives and the great number of concubines, right? He's having a party. My Lord, he's partying hard and he gets besides himself and the party turns into a frenzy. There, It goes from just a party to drinking. Uh, they're having a drunken orgy. A dissolute, uh, extravagant riot. Hallelujah. They're wrapped up in their passions and madness. They're wrapped up uh, in all kinds of evilness. They, they just lost it. 
it was an act of blasphemy to take the holy vessels that were in God's house and desecrate them. And while they're drinking wine out of these vessels, they're praying to the gods of silver and brass and stone. Hallelujah. They were sinning hard. And these sins that they were committing are the same kinds of sins that's rife today. Many have no time for God. They're doing their own thing. There is no respect. There is no adherence to. There is no care for what is considered to be holy. Anything of God is holy. Hallelujah. In this world today, they're defying him. They're thumbing their nose up at God. Yes, they're cursing at God. They're paying him no mind. They're defying God for the things of the world. I want to take you to Psalms number seven, verse 11. Look at what the psalmist says. God judgeth the righteous and God is angry with the wicked every day. I'm going to read that again. God judges the righteous and God is angry with the wicked every day. Not only is he angry, but God is jealous of his honor. Especially when holy things have been profaned. I want you to hear me tonight. Especially when holy things have been profaned. And we read in his word uh, of his punishment in connection with the ark of the covenant at Beth Shemesh. Remember Uzziah when he tried to stop the ark from falling? 1 Samuel 6, 19. And he smote the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. Even he smote the people 50,000 and threescore and 10 men. And the people lamented because the Lord had smitten many of the people with a great slaughter because they were mishandling his glory. He got angry at Uzzah when he touched the ark. Remember 2 Samuel 6. And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor. 2 Samuel 6, 6 and 7. Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it. For the oxen shook it and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah. And God smote him there for his error. And there he died by the ark of God. He even judged Saul, when he offered a burnt offering, 1 Samuel 13, 9 through 14. And Saul said, bring hither a burnt offering to me and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. Now Saul is doing something that only the, the high priest was supposed to do. Only someone who has been sanctified and set aside to do this. And Saul is taking, King Saul is taking it upon himself to circumvent God's word and do it his way. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of the offering, the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. And Samuel said, what hast thou done? Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattered from me and that thou camest not within the days appointed and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash. Therefore said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself therefore and offered a burnt offering. Samuel said to Saul, thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. Somebody that's going to obey me and do it my way. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people. Because you have not kept that which the Lord commanded you. Hallelujah. And we see his displeasure when Uzziah offered incense. Second Chronicles 26. But when he was strong, 16 through 19. 
Second Chronicles 26, verses 16 through 19. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. And Azariah the priest went in after him, and with him fourscore priests of the Lord that were valiant men. And they withstood Uzziah the king, and said unto him, It appeareth not unto thee, Uzziah, the burnt incense unto the Lord, but to the priest of the sons of Aaron. He too wants to circumvent and step into the holies of holies. And he has not been sanctified. But the priest of the sons of Aaron that are consecrated to burn incense, go out of the sanctuary, for thou hast trespassed, neither shall it be for thine honor from the Lord God. Then Uzziah was wroth and had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth with the priests, leprosy, hallelujah, the leprosy even rose up in his forehead before the priests in the house of the Lord from beside the incense altar. So it was that when the proceedings at the feast were at their height, they're drunk, they're praying even in their drunkenness to false gods. God couldn't take it anymore. He steps in. Let's read verses five and six, Daniel five, five and six, Daniel five, five and six, Daniel five, I'm doing this for Sister Marbury. I'm taking my time. Daniel 5, verses 5 through 6. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. King's countenance changed. Could you imagine? Drunk as a skunk and all of a sudden you see a hand not attached to any, but you see a hand writing on the wall. And when he sees it, he gets pale. His countenance changes and his thoughts are troubled so that the joints of his loins were loosed and his knees smote one against another. My Lord. Let's go to verse 7 and 8 of that same chapter. Let's read a little further. Verses 7 and 8. It says, the king cried aloud to bring in this the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers. And the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, whoever can read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed. I'll give you new clothes and I'll put a gold chain about your neck and I'll make you the third ruler in my kingdom. Hallelujah. God is speaking. And he doesn't understand what's happening, but God is speaking. What a solemn thing when God speaks to a man. Yeah, I'd rather God speak to me out of his pleasure than speak to me out of his anger. Because he's coming now to judge. He's had enough. You have desecrated what is holy. You have just disrespected everything concerning me and if it wasn't for me you wouldn't be sitting where you are now yes so God when God speaks to a man whether he is a king or a commoner whether he's a bishop or a deacon whether he sings in the choir or whether he's an usher when God speaks to a man he's going to have to pay attention no matter who you are, what your status is, when God speaks to you, you better listen. This is what we're told about Belshazzar. He just does what he wants to do. And there are others who did it as well, but they had to deal with the wrath of God. The second thing we need to talk about is what we are told about the queen. And we get this out of verses 10 and 12, 10 through 12 rather, Daniel 5, 10 through 12. Now, the queen, by reason of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banquet house. And the king spake and said, O king, the queen rather spake and said, O king, live forever. Let not thy thoughts trouble thee, nor let thy countenance be changed. 
There is a man in the kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. In the days of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, was found in him whom the king Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, the king, I say, thy father, made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. For as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding, interpreting of dreams and showing of hard sentences and dissolving of doubts were found in the same Daniel, whom the king named Belshazzar. Now let Daniel be called and he will show the interpretation. She is the queen mother. She is the widow of Nebuchadnezzar. And two things we should note here. We should note, number one, the power and the influence of this woman. This is grandma. She is the queen mama. And we don't know too much about her except she was not at the feast. We know that much. She comes in after everything has happened. And she must have got word. She heard about what happened. The fact that he didn't understand the handwriting that was on the wall. So she wasn't at the feast, but because she was Nebuchadnezzar's wife, she knew that this God of Israel was no joke. She knew that this was a real God. He had power. So she wouldn't come to the feast, but she knew about the power of God. She may have been a believer even. She knew Daniel, and she was not afraid to speak to this man who was known for his piety. She had great influence. What an influence. Queen mothers can exert upon a nation, someone who was spiritual. That's why I thank God we call them missionaries and mothers. We don't call them queen mothers uh, in the kingdom of God, but I thank God for the praying mothers, those that have seen the power of God. And they don't have a fear of speaking to power. Son, you need to pray more. Son, you need to pay attention. Yes. What a great influence the mothers of God, the mothers of Zion have in the church. They can, they can bring to bear upon the kingdom of God because of their wisdom. I've seen the power of God. Power and influence of Daniel. We see this here in the first seven words of verse 11 of chapter 5. We see the power and influence also of Daniel in the 11th chapter, first seven words. There is a man in thy kingdom. <laughs> so also how great it is to have men who are available to the Lord and ready to do his will. Men who are holy and dedicated. Men who are courageous. That, that was Daniel. You know what I think? I think all of us in our respective places need to just step up and be what God wants us to be in our day. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, mother, to call on the name of God and to speak what God has given you to say. Don't be afraid my brother, to stand out and declare what you know to be right and holy. Don't be afraid. Be courageous. Daniel 5 and 12. For as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding, interpreting of dreams and showing of hard sentences and dissolving of doubts were found in the same Daniel, that same Daniel that was taken out of Jerusalem and put in chains and brought into Babylonia, that same Daniel whose name was changed to Belshazzar, let that Daniel be called and he will show you the interpretation. Queen Mother said, I know a man. I've seen his God work. Call him. He'll tell you what you need to know. So let's get into what we are told about Daniel. We've got to remember that at this period, again, Daniel is about 80 years old. He's, he's up in age. 70 years have passed since he's been captured. 
and deported from Jerusalem to Babylon. So verses 13 through 16 speak of the king's inquiry, his explanation and his enticement. I won't read it all. And in verse 17, when you read verse 17, it tells of Daniel's bold refusal. And in verses 18 through 24, we have what we may call Daniel's sermon to the king, right? It's marked by a, a forthright, a telling forth of God's message against the background of his dealings with men and of nations. So he had courage. He's telling the king, you did a whole lot of stuff you shouldn't, you had no business doing. And you knew it was wrong. He, he had some courage. What courage? So if you look at verses in uh, 22 and 23, we'll see that. But let's compare those two verses to Proverbs 28 and 1, where it says, The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Listen, when you know that you're living right and you're in God's will, you don't have to cower down to the enemy. You don't have to be afraid so look at that. We're comparing it and we're, we see his explanation of the writing on the wall in verse 24. And he has his interpretation of the writing, the words of which are many, many tekel parson. Many, many tekel parson. If I give you a literal translation, it means numbered, numbered, weighed, divided. Numbered numbered way divided he shows the king that the word many indicated that god had numbered belshazzar kingdom and finished it let me take inventory let me see what's here take a good look at it because i'm getting ready to shut you down mm -hmm. so god numbered belshazzar kingdom and finishes it tekel means that Belshazzar himself was weighed on the scales and found wanting. He's found guilty. He's found wanting, my Lord. Mm -hmm. Perez indicated that the kingdom now is going to be split up and divided. I'm going to split it up between the Medes and the Persians. That was the vision or the interpretation of the dream earlier on in the book. Belshazzar wakes up to the terrible truth that while he had been living in sin, God had been weighing up his life. While he was living in sin, God was weighing his life. And we have to be careful because, child of God, while we're living in sin and doing whatever we want to do and forgetting all about God, God is weighing us. He's checking us out. So God had been weighing up his life and he had been found wanting and his doom was sealed. He had a choice to live right all this time. We have a choice to live right. And if we're not careful, we'll seal our own failure. Holiness without no man shall see the Lord. So surprisingly, when Daniel finishes his pronouncement the king wants to honor God's servant I just told you you're gonna you your kingdom is going to be split up you're gonna fall and you still want to reward me Daniel finishes his pronouncement the king honors him that's in verse 29 but it was too late you can't pay God off paying tithes is, is not going to get you into heaven putting money in the offering plate, uh, isn't going to get you in, in right graces with God. You have to obey God's word. You have to be holy. Belshazzar's fate was sealed. He did not repent. He just starts paying off. Maybe if I do this, maybe if I do that. So that's what we're told about Daniel. Daniel stood up. This 80-year-old man stood up without fear and told him the interpretation of the dream without fear. And it was not in the king's favor. Yes. So let's find out what we learn about God in this. 
because in Daniel, the fifth chapter, verses 30 and 31, it says, in that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. Darius the Median took the kingdom, being about three score and two years old. That makes a very solemn and sobering reading because everything happened just like God said it would. And I think this is something we take for granted with people. We'll accept, oh, he's going to bless me. He loves me. But you don't want to accept the fact that the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life. You don't want to accept the fact that he requires holiness from us and obedience. Everything that's in the word is going to happen just like God said so. His predictions, his prophecies, everything Daniel said was going to happen. This is what God told me to tell you. His predictions and prophecies were literally fulfilled. And his word will never return unto him void. So let's deal with the sequence of truth about God in this chapter. All right. This, there's a sequence of truth. So for that, we have to we have to go all the way up to, to verse number three. I'm in chapter five of Daniel. And um, let's take our time with this, shall we? I'm, I'm, I'll do my best. To hurry up and to be honest with you, I'm, I'm really almost to the end of this. Verse number three. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem. And the king and his princes, his wives, his concubines drank in them. Verse number three shows us that God's name was blasphemed. God's name was blasphemy. I want to take you to Galatians 6, 7 and 8. Galatians 6, verses 7 and 8. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So in verse 3, his name is being blasphemed. And verse number 5, the hand of the Lord is being revealed. Let's read it. Daniel 5, verse number 5. It says these words, in the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote his hand. I'm showing my hand. He shows his hand. His name is being blasphemed. And he decides, I'm going to show my hand. Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 21. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, thou fool, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. This is a king having a feast, drinking, and he gets beside himself and he blasphemes the name of God. Now God is showing his hand. He was being a fool. His soul was poor. And verse 11, his witness is identified. 
Daniel 5, verse 11, his witness is identified. Let's read this verse together. There is a man in thy kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods was found in him. Whom the king Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, the king, I say thy father, made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. So his witness now is identified. There is a man who knows how to live. There is a man who has a word for you. His witness is identified. Verse 3, the Lord's name is blasphemed. Verse 5, God's hand is revealed. Verse 11, his witness is identified. Compare this verse 11 to Acts 14 and 7. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness and that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons filling our hearts with food and gladness in the 18th verse God's sovereignty is being declared verse 18 O thou king the most high God Gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom. This is Daniel speaking truth to power. O thou king, the most high God, gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. His sovereignty is being declared. Compare that to what is written in Daniel chapter 4, verse number 3. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation <laughs> to generation, my Lord. In verses 22 and 23, the Lord's justice is vindicated. Let's read that. Verses 22 and 23. The Lord's justice is vindicated. And thou, his son, O Belshazzar, has not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this, but has lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven. And they have brought the vessels of his house before thee. And thou and your lords and your wives and your concubines have drunk wine in them, and has praised the gods of silver, gold, and brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know, and the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, has not glorified. You're praising false gods, but you won't worship and take time to worship the true God. So my justice is vindicated. Let's compare that to Romans 1 and 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So the Lord will deal with what is wrong. He will deal with sin. He will deal with all of this disrespect to his holiness, to his name. He's going to reveal his hand. He has a witness. He has, he has people who are standing in place who are still true witnesses to his name. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run therein and they are safe. His sovereignty is declared in this chapter and his justice vindicated. In verse 24 though, he gives his ultimatum. He will not tolerate it. He will come to a place where he says enough is enough. Then was the part of the hand sent from him. And his writing was written. So he pronounced his ultimatum. Many, many tekel parson. 
Proverbs 29 and 1. He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed. And that without remedy. So you keep being hard-headed and rebelling against God. God will suddenly come along and say, that's enough. It's a solemn chapter. Yeah. So let's compare and contrast the two men in this chapter. One is clothed with the kingly robes. That's Belshazzar. Which only covered a worthless heart. He's filled with pride. He's showing off. He's wrapped up in all of the gold and silver he has. And he thinks that he can do anything and God not deal with him. The other man is drawn from a life of simplicity and solitude. He's praying. He has a life with God, ready to act for God in public, right? As he loved to speak to God in private, but he's not afraid to act for God in public. So the former is looking back upon his wasted life and the latter reviewing his past with no sting of regret. I'll do what I want to do. I'm the king. Mm -hmm. We have to take our stand with one of these men. Decide which one you're going to be like. You're going to be like Belshazzar. I got this, I got that, and I'm, I'm old enough to do this and I don't need that. When it's God that allowed you to be where you are, Mm -hmm. The former looked back upon his wasted life and the latter reviewing his past with no sting of regret and no scars to mar his testimony. Take your stand. Who will you be like? Belshazzar or Daniel? Let's see what Job says in chapter 9, verse 4. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength who have hardened himself against him and have prospered. That's a question. That's a question that Job is asking. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who, who do you know that hardens himself against God and is able to prosper? Who do you know? I mean, he may have a little money in the bank, but when it's all said and done, this is why the Lord spoke to David and gives him a song and says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down and wither as the green herb. So I hear some of you talking to me, and we, we'll do it. We're getting ready to close out. But how do we tie it into what, what's going on today? And it's not just the world that needs a wake-up call, but it's it's... It's the church, too. And so you might say, what does all that have to do with us today? So let me answer this way. A discerning mind can draw several conclusions or several lessons. That's why I said Daniel is about a prophetic history. If you pay attention, you will not make the same mistakes so-and-so made. So this book is dealing with pride, judgment against pride. I don't need God. And believe it or not, there are people in church that live as though to say, I really don't need God. They forget all about God. When it is God that allowed you, he gave you power to obtain wealth. So how does chapter 5 of Daniel speak to people today? So... Let's talk about it. Number one, pride and arrogance have consequences. Pride and arrogance have consequences. Belshazzar despised and defied the God of the Bible. I don't care what God says. I'm going to do what I want to do. I don't care. And as a result, he loses his kingdom and he loses his life. So that's the first thing. Mm -hmm. Pride and arrogance have consequences. Number two, forgetfulness 
can be fatal. Forgetfulness can be fatal. His grandma had to come and say, oh, there's a man here that can, that can tell you what's going on. She had seen the power of God. She didn't forget. Belshazzar knew. He's a king. He knew the history. He knew about the God of Israel. Yes, forgetfulness can be fatal. Belshazzar forgot the lessons his predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar, had learned. You don't think he knew? My grandfather had to crawl on his belly and eat grass like a cow. Everybody called him crazy, but the God of Israel brought him to his knees. You don't think he heard that there is a God in heaven who rules in the affairs of men? Hallelujah. And brings down those who walk in pride? Daniel chapter 4, verses 34 through 37. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven and mine understanding. Return unto me, and I blessed the Most High. And I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can say, none can stay, rather, his hand, or say unto him, what are you doing? He's the boss. At the same time, my reason return unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness return unto me, and my counselors and my Lord sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise. I praise him now. <laughs> I wasn't doing it before, but I praise him now. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. All whose works are truth and his ways, judgment, and those that walk in pride, those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. So the first thing, if we have a discerning mind, we learn from this chapter, pride and arrogance have consequences. Second thing is forgetfulness can be fatal. The third thing is negligence carries a big cost. Yes, negligence can be a very expensive lesson to learn. Belshazzar ignored the signs of the times. A lot of saints of God are ignoring the signs of the times. He was not watching. He was surrounded by his enemies. He was not being alert. I hear the word of God saying, watch therefore, for you know not when the Son of Man shall appear. Be ye ready. He ignored the signs of the times. He was not watching when he was surrounded by his enemies. And his city was literally taken by surprise. The fourth thing we, we learned is that when Belshazzar finally saw the handwriting on the wall, it was too late. I don't want that to happen to me or anyone else. I don't let it said be too that said that it's too late when people see the handwriting on the wall. It's too late. He had already crossed the line. He had already reached the end of his rope, and God brought him and his kingdom down. So I know there are a lot of critics that just dismiss the accounts. Uh, and say it, all this is irrelevant to the nations uh, today in this 21st century. Uh, but those of us who know the Lord and understand his word have a different perspective. In my studies, I came across these words uh, from a Spanish philosopher. His name is George Santayana. This is what he says, I quote, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Let me say that again. Those, I quote from George Santana, 
those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it, close quote. In other words, if we fail to learn the lessons of history, we're bound to repeat the mistakes of history. Mm -hmm. um, there's another writer, he's, a, he's considered to be a social critic. He's a critic. Um, and he says these words, and I quote, a generation that fails to read the signs of the times may be forced to read the writing on the wall. Close quote. I like that one. A generation that fails to read the signs of the times may be forced to read the writing on the wall. Mm -hmm. Five centuries after the fall of Babylon, Paul says these words, and it's important. All these things happen as examples to them. They're written for an admonition so that we would learn upon whom the ends of the ages have come. I'll read it exactly the way he wrote it. 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Now all these things happen unto them for an example. and They are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So the Bible clearly reveals that these events are recorded to teach us lessons. So we can avoid making the same mistakes if we have eyes to see, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. But if you have eyes and you're observing and discerning the signs of the times all around us, there are signs of the times all around us today, clearly visible. But most of the time it's sad. Many people are ignoring the signs. Wars and rumors of wars. Famine and pestilence in diverse places. Look how evil the world has become. And we are still, the church is still just going about its business, not paying attention. Right? How many hours, right, do people spend on Facebook or watching TV or playing video games? I'm talking about the saints, not just people outside of the church. Right today, and we have all the social media, Facebook, television, video games, right? All those things, if we're not careful, will blind us to the significance of what's happening all around us. Instead of praying and taking notice, we get our phones and want to film it too. But there's a whole lot of wickedness out here and things are going from bad to worse. Do we recognize the dangers that are threatening our culture and the future of our nations? Are we aware of the, the warnings that are being sounded loud all around us? It's getting crazier and crazier. Shocking and unbelievable changes are taking place, right? This is a nation that we're living in that once took pride in proclaiming in God we trust a so-called Christian America, right? Uh, let's dig back into history a little bit. Uh, Andrew Jackson, he said these words, the Bible was the foundation of the republic, right? Atheists and secularists regularly win battles to banish prayer. If you look at the history, prayer, they went to court and banished prayer from schools and took all of this, removed the Ten Commandments from in front of the courthouse, right? Uh, instead of learning the truth about creation and Jesus Christ, right? We want them to learn about Muhammad and Shiva or Hare Krishna or uh, let's teach them how to be a witch. Let's teach them witchcraft in school. That's happening today. Oh, yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. In, in other nations, in England, where martyrs once died to uphold their understanding of the Bible. That's part of church history. Children now are learning in grade school how to practice safe sex. In elementary school. Yeah. 
there were theologians and, and preachers and teachers who wrote about the impending death of Christianity in Britain, in Holland. I have in my notes uh, where the product, part of the Protestant Reformation took place, right? The Puritans uh, who would later come uh, to America. Uh, why don't we teach about stuff like that anymore? They later came to America. And instead, uh, we have prostitution and deviant sex and drug parlors that are now prominent features of our society. Yeah. You can go to Australia uh, and, have, and stand there and watch flamboyant parades that are being performed by homosexual, homosexuals, right? It's one of the biggest tourist attractions in Australia is to go there on vacation and watch the gay parade. It's better than anything you could come to here in America. People pay a whole lot of money just to go and watch sin march down the street. Times are changing. 50 years ago, um, if you had predicted this would be going on in America and other countries around us or other Western nations, your credibility would be would tarnished. People would tell you to shut up, right? Uh, because those ideas are unthinkable. Uh, but our Judeo-Christian culture is being deliberately undermined. The word of God is systematically being undermined socially. All these social changes that ignore, defy, and reject clear biblical teachings, the marriage issue, what is a family, right? Now they're putting it into law. No, no longer is marriage defined as being between a male and, and a female. All of this. So today's practices that once prevailed uh, in, in years ago are being changed. And now these evil things are being put to the forefront. Uh, abortion, infanticide, uh, euthanism, occultism, right? The worship of nature have all reemerged to re-challenge and displace the truth and values that once defined our nation and our culture. And we got to be decided, are we going to be like Daniel or Belshazzar? My God. All of these changes are happening around us. And I believe, my brothers and sisters, if we're not careful, we'll be like Belshazzar and we'll see the finger writing on the wall. We have the word of God telling us, be ye all so ready. Be holy, for I am am holy the handwriting i believe for many is already on the wall because they're denying the power of god and they're rejecting his truth and i dare say even in the house of god some who are turning away from the truth and turning god's truth into a lie turning their face away from his holiness and deciding and saying to God, I no longer need you. I can make it without you. The devil is a liar. Hallelujah. I want to live so God can use me. And I want to live so right until heaven belongs to me. I'm going to stop right there. But the handwriting is on the wall. God is writing to this nation. He's writing to a people who continue to reject and walk in their own way. Who will you be like? Will you be like his child, holy? Or will you be like the world, dismissive and rejecting the truth of God? The choice is yours. The word is out there. God is real. He's a God of love. He's also a God of judgment. Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, I've shared your word. 
I've shared what you've put on my heart to share with them. I pray, Lord, that we'll take this thought-provoking word and examine ourselves and take inventory of ourselves. If there's any pride, Lord, we don't want to be prideful. We don't want to reject your truth. We don't want to walk in our flesh. We don't want to forget about you. Hallelujah. We want to remember your goodness and to serve you all the days of our life. I pray that you touch the hearts and minds of those who are connected with us tonight that will continue to be and only be what you have us to be. In Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you. I'm going to stop there. If you have a special request, you want to touch and agree with me in prayer, send it in, won't you? Admin at grtdc.org. And someone from the staff will retrieve that request. And I'll take that request and lay it on the altar as I call on the name of the Lord. If you want to make a donation or pay your tithes or give an offering to this ministry, you may do so. Technician will put that on the bottom of the screen. Follow those instructions. Those of you who are at the Annex in the Bronx, you may use Givelify. Or as Mother Van or Elder Blackwood passes the basket, you can give that way. Those of you who are in the temple, those of you of Jeremiah Temple in Baltimore, I'll see you, Lord willing, on Thursday. Hold that seed. Yes, and we'll plant it together at the end of Bible lesson. The Lord bless you. I'm looking forward to joining you again on next week. But until then, three things I want you to do. Mm -hmm. Be careful, be prayerful, and be holy. Shalom, shalom.